start now. So uh, welcome everyone to the second day of the ICTP's Hitchhiker's Guide to Condensed Matter and Statistical Physics that is dedicated to machine learning in condensed matter. Uh, so before today's lecture by Bingqing Chang from University of Cambridge, I'd just like to remind you that uh, we'll have next two appointments on uh, next two Wednesdays. Uh, but in particular, next Wednesday on 27th of January, we will start earlier. So 12.30 European, uh, uh, Central European time. So just check on the program to be sure that uh, you're here. And then the final lecture on the 1st of February will be by Juan Garasquilla that will start in regular time at 2 p.m. So that's it for me. And today uh, uh, I leave uh, the floor to uh, Alex Rodriguez, who will introduce Bing Chin Chang and uh, monitor, uh, the uh, discussion. Okay, so Alex, please. Hello to everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you, Bing Chin, for being here. Uh, well, let me introduce Bing, Bing Chin. She is now a uh, and please, Vincent, correct me if I do something wrong. She's now at Cambridge. At the, she's now a fellow in Cambridge. I don't know which, an early career fellow. It's exactly your position, I think so. Yeah. And today she's, she's done, she has done a lot of work on machine learning on atomic systems. And we are going to listen some of her work and some kind of before an introduction and then uh, the Q&A for this session, uh, well, I think Bing Qing will stop every quarter of hour or something like that, and she will replay your questions. I will remind you to write it in the Q&A box, please, because in this way we can check it. And that's all from my side, mm, please. Thanks, Alex, for the introduction. So let me share my screen first. So as Alex has mentioned, I'll talk about machine learning, but uh, more importantly, the application of machine learning uh, to materials modeling. And uh, as Alex also mentioned, like I'll stop uh, every 15 minutes to answer questions. So the first hour of the lecture is about basic notions. So that's the fundamentals. And during the second hour, I'll talk a little bit about more um, applications, which are basically uh, my own work. I think uh, I actually estimate the first part is a little bit longer than the second part, but that's okay. We can move a little bit to the second part as well. I think the fundamentals are in any case more important uh, than the recent work I have done. Okay, so let's get started. So let's start from the very beginning. Like what is a uh, first principle calculations? What is ab initial methods? So in the ab initial methods in this context, meaning means that we predict material properties that we predict the motion of electrons and nuclei starting from the Schrodinger equation. Now, uh, the significance of quantum mechanics and the Schrodinger's equation can be kind of reflected by this quote from Paul Dirac. The rest is chemistry. And what he means is not something dismissive towards chemistry, because what he really means is that the fundamental laws and equations that are necessary for material property prediction are completely known. But the difficulty is that these equations are just too complex to be solved. So what is the solution? According to Darek, uh, we can develop approximate practical methods so that we can make the, the solvation of quantum mechanics trackable. Now with that in mind, let's look at the methods that we have. So we have the Schrodinger's equation that cannot be solved exactly except for the simplest system, such as a, a hydrogen atom. And then we have reference methods such as quantum Monte Carlo or coupled cluster methods. And then the workhorse of the field is the so-called density functional theory with different levels of approximations as well. Uh, so, so typically, we are able to model a system with hundreds of atoms on a time scale of 10 to the minus 12 seconds using density functional theory. 
And then we can model the system using empirical force fields, meaning that we just assume two atoms would uh, interact to each other via a sort of empirical or a simple analytic functional form. But the empirical methods, they lack the quantitative accuracy. Now, uh, so with that in mind, uh, with this uh, preliminary uh, slides in mind, now what we are going to talk about uh, during the first hour of the lecture, we'll first talk a little bit about the fundamentals of statistical mechanics as well as atomistic modeling. And then we will go to, the, we'll change gears slightly to go to the machine learning part. So I, uh, uh, so David, I think David and, and co-workers gave some, uh, gave some talk uh, about the basics of machine learning. But here we are going to focus on how do we translate our physical systems? How do we translate the system of materials and molecules into the mathematical language uh, that machine learning model can use? How do we translate the physical problem uh, into a design matrix? And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about machine learning potentials using uh, machine learning methods to approximate the interactions between atoms. So, Let's start with a little bit of thermodynamics. So we have, uh, so from a thermodynamic point of view, the Gibbs free energy of a system has two compositions. We have an enthalpic uh, contribution, and then we have an entropic contribution. So as the simplest example, when we have a solid and liquid, and uh, the, the, with the free energy can both be expressed in these terms, when the temperature is low, the free energy of the solid is lower, so the system stays solid. But when the temperature increases, the entropic contribution becomes more and more important. So the solid will melt and the stable phase will become the liquid phase. Now, from a statistical point of view, uh, the free energy is actually a measure of probability. So the free energy difference between the solid and liquid can be expressed in terms of the log of the probability of observing the liquid uh, divided by the probability of observing the solid. This is a very simple uh, expression, but however, bear in mind that the probability of observing the liquid or the solid means the probability of observing all the possible configurations that uh, belong to the liquid state. And there are many, many of them. And they all look similar, but they all differ um, by where the atoms actually are. Now, uh, the, the founding father of statistical mechanics, uh, the, the Boltzmann, so the Boltzmann uh, has an expression of the entropy on his grave and reads the entropy of the system is the Boltzmann's constant uh, times the log of the number of microstates. A microstate are, are, is just a snapshot that I've been showing before. It's a specific realization of the coordinates and velocity of all the particles. Now, this expression engraved uh, on the tombstone is actually not correct uh, because the correct expression, not only we have to consider, just consider the number of microstates, but we also have to weigh them properly using the Boltzmann's uh, distribution. So the entropic term can be expressed in terms of the weighted sum. So, uh, by far, you might have noticed we already have a conflict, meaning that, uh, so in, in, in a sense, like when we are computing the energy of the system, we have a whole spectrum of quantum mechanical methods with different level of accuracy as well as costs. So to compute energy accurately, we want to go to the uh, more expensive and more accurate methods. But however, to, uh, to sample the number or to sample the microstates 
in a satisfactory, in a comprehensive manner, then we want the methods to be cheaper. So there's a conflict there. And uh, during this talk, I'll, I'll explain how can machine learning resolve this conflict. So uh, just, uh, uh, just some uh, very uh, fundamental and very important information on how do we actually sample the microstates. Because right, in no circumstances, we want to enumerate the microstates uh, because it's a very high dimensional object if we have n atoms in our system. So we will be sampling this six times n dimensional space and that, that is not trackable. So uh, there are two pathways forward. And the first one is the Monte Carlo sampling. So the end game is that we always want to sample from the Boltzmann distribution. So, so, the, uh, so uh, omega is the microstate and uh, the, uh, the microstates are populated according to the Boltzmann distribution weighted by the an enthalpy of each microstate. Now, uh, so the fundamental principle of Monte Carlo sampling, uh, the important sampling is that uh, we, instead of sample, uh, sample on generate uncorrelated microstates, we have a sequence of correlated states. So I start from a certain point uh, in my phase space and I make a move uh, uh, from, uh, let's say, omega to omega prime with a certain probability. Now, uh, it can be shown that if, uh, if the probability uh, P of omega is invariant under this move, then we eventually will be ended up sampling the correct uh, Boltzmann distribution. However, uh, this X integral here is quite difficult to implement in practice. So in reality, we, uh, when we do the sampling, we often impose a stronger condition, which is called detailed balance. So in the detailed balance, we are saying that uh, we have to, let's say if we have two uh, microstates, uh, P of omega and P of omega prime, the move back uh, the move from omega to omega prime and the move backwards, uh, the ratio of them should be equal to the ratio of the probability of omega and omega prime themselves. Now, uh, the one possible option of sampling, also according to this detailed balance, is the famous uh, metropolis sampling. So it is saying that uh, if the, uh, so typically we have a diagonal matrix and what we are saying that the probability of, uh, if the uh, probability of uh, Omega, uh, omega prime is uh, higher than P of omega. We always accept this move and otherwise we accept the move with a certain probability that is equal to the ratio between the probability of these two microstates. So to, to show this graphically, like, uh, so this is a very uh, simple uh, scenario with like in 2D uh, with limited number of particles. So each time we propose a move, uh, if the energy of the system goes down, meaning that if the probability uh, goes up, we always accept the move, but otherwise uh, we accept it conditionally depending on the energy increase of this move. So this is the one way of sampling our microstates. Uh, but honestly, like Monte Carlo is not that common these days, but I just, but the, the, the underlying principle is very nice. Now, the other method to sample the system is to use um, molecular dynamics, which uh, in fact is relying on a Newtonian mechanics. So what we are doing is that uh, we, it is a very uh, simple picture. We compute the force uh, on each particle, and then we propagate this trajectory just using the classical Newton's equation of motion. And we ha also have to do some additional tricks to control the system's temperature as well as 
pressure. And the Bible for this type of sampling is the Don, Don Franco and the Baron Smith book, Understanding and Molecular Simulation. So, uh, so uh, there's a, however, that, that is not the whole picture. And the reason for that is, it typically, when we do molecular dynamic simulations, the time scale is fairly short. And if the system has to local minim uh, to has to minima in its free energy profile. So in back to this example of solid and liquid. And solid and liquid can be understood as two equilibrium states on the free energy profile. And what would happen if we just do a kosher molecular dynamics is that uh, when we start from the liquid state and do the molecular dynamics, the system would remain in the liquid state. And if we start from the solid, the system will also trap in the solid state. This is because the thermal fluctuation is often not enough to overcome the, this very high uh, activation barrier. So to overcome this, there's a method that is called a uh, uh, metadynamics that is developed by a uh, Alexandra Lyle and Michele Palinello. And I would like to use a hiking simile uh, to explain how this works. So can you see uh, which uh, mountain is this? So uh, this is the Matterhorn, and I think this can also be viewed from the Italians, both the Italian side as well as the Swiss side. So the profile of the mountain can be uh, can be likened to a free energy profile. And uh, the valleys are the equilibrium states and the peak uh, is similar to the activation barrier. If we want to travel from A to B, we have to spend a lot of energy to climb up the peak uh, and wait for a very long time. However, there's an alternative, which is uh, to, to hiking. Now, what if I, uh, I, I travel on this landscape and I deposit a heap of sand whenever I go? So imagine if you do this long enough, what will eventually happen is that we will even up this free energy landscape and make it flat so the system can go back and forth without much, uh, without much resistance. And the nice, another nice aspect of the method is like at the end of the simulation, just by checking how much sand is deposited at uh, uh, each spot, and we take the inverse of that, uh, and, and, and we, we, we take the negative of that, then we recover the actual free energy profile. So, uh, and, and there's, an, uh, there's an alternative method for performing free energy calculation. And, and that is called thermodynamic integration. So the idea there is that, uh, so we, we have, uh, so uh, let's start uh, from a slightly easier uh, approximation. So um, we can use the minimum potential energy at zero Kelvin, we can neglect the entropic, uh, entropic con uh, contribution altogether at low temperature and just use the minimum potential energy as the proxy for our free energy. Or we can assume that uh, our system behave like a harmonic oscillator and we take the harmonic approximation uh, and uh, add the harmonic contribution of the free energy. And then there's also the option of uh, doing everything properly and taking into account of enharmonicity as well. So uh, in that picture, uh, we perform a thermodynamic integration. The idea is that this is a very general concept. So the idea there is that if we have two systems and somehow I can connect them using a reversible thermodynamic path, then the free energy, ah, sorry, here I flipped the, uh, here I flipped the sign, should be like from, uh, from, from B to A. Now, 
the difference in free energy between these two systems can be just expressed uh, uh, as the integral of the uh, finite difference when we go along this path. So that's a very general idea. And this path in particular can be anything. It can be a path along thermodynamic variable like temperature, pressure, or, or other things, or it can be a switching parameter dif between different Hamiltonians. So in practice, we all, all we usually do a switching between a harmonic system and our actual system because the harmonic system has analytic free energy that we can express very easily. Uh, so in practice, we, we typically follow a recipe, right? We start from a harmonic reference and then we integrate to a real crystal and then we go up. Uh, we can choose to go up in the temperature or like go between a different pressure. So this is the uh, recipe that we always use with some justifications because like we have to do uh, the switching between harmonic to a harmonic at the relatively low temperature because when temperature is high, uh, this integral uh, becomes divergent. This is because at high temperature, like diffusive behavior happens to make the system very non-harmonic. Uh, and another thing that we often do is that uh, we need to, we, we typically do, if we want to compute the Gibbs free energy, we first start from a MVT ensemble, we start from the constant pressure and temperature ensemble. This is because the pressure is not well defined for the reference harmonic system. So we cannot place a harmonic system under the MPT, the constant pressure ensemble. So uh, there are typically uh, also some a number of tricks that we can play, but uh, in the interest of time, I will not go through them. Uh, so I just want to point out uh, uh, the some time ago, we have written a tutorial style paper uh, to explain uh, the tricks as well as the fundamentals of computing Gibbs free energy using thermodynamic integration. And this is accompanied by the Python notebooks for data analysis, as well as sample input files. Uh, and and I can I'll just quickly show a couple of examples for uh, to show why this free accurate free energy estimation is important. Then I'll try to answer a couple of questions. Now the example here I'm showing the free energy of the vacancy formation uh, in BCC iron. So we have the approximation at it just using the potential energy difference, and then. It, that, that is the black line here. We have the ones that use a harmonic approximation. And then we have the accurate estimation taking into account of N harmonicity using thermodynamic integration. At low temperature, uh, they, they are all uh, very similar. But however, as the temperature goes high, even the harmonic approximation is not sufficient enough uh, to capture the accurate vacancy formation free energy. So here's a similar example that computes the stacking for free energy in FCC uh, metals. And you can, uh, it, it's the same idea. You can see like uh, at high temperature, the harmonic or the, the potential energy approximation, uh, are, they are not only uh, quantitatively inaccurate, but even the overall trend, like even uh, it can even get the sign wrong. Okay, I think now is a good time to stop uh, to answer some questions. Uh, so, uh, so there's a question from uh, a question. Uh, Rower, uh, like Christian, do you want to uh, speak up and ask the question yourself? Or are they, uh, uh, or are the students allowed to to speak with the Zoom setup? Okay, so uh, Christian asks, will we only be dealing with equilibrium systems? Uh, I think this is, I I think this is uh, mostly the case. Although, like 
uh, strictly speaking, when we are using metadynamics, the system is in a quasi equilibrium. But yes, this is mostly uh, this. This is mostly the case. And uh, uh, Raj, uh, Raj, do you want to speak up? Uh, so is the uh, so Raj asks. Uh, yes. Uh, I can allow us to speak if you want. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's better. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, ma'am. I would like to ask uh, is detail balance and the metabolic sampling are linked to each other? Or uh, this detail balance is applicable in all condition as it has certain condition that when we are going from uh, one micro state to another micro state, so in uh, it has the same probability of, of the uh, when we move from the second one to the first one, but uh, it seems that this uh, is not the this condition is not favorable for uh, each ex uh, uh, each of the experimental conditions. Uh, so, so you mentioned this experimental condition. Can you elaborate this a little bit more? So, what, what does this mean? Uh, like, uh, uh, like. The probability of going from uh, one of the phase, uh, like a material goes from one phase to another phase, and he is not capable to uh, uh, recreate the same thing, like uh, come back to the same, uh, same, uh, like uh, material has two phases. One is in the uh, low temperature phase, and one is in the high temperature phase. Mm -hmm. And material is such that when it's moved from low temperature to high temperature, it's Phase transition takes place, and in that case, there is a certain probability that it moves from uh, one state to another state. But the if reverse condition is not possible, so this detailed balance that we have applied that you have said in my Monte Carlo sampling is strong condition is of detailed balance where we uh, equate these two probability product of two uh, probabilities. So that that I. Doubted that that can be happen in the uh, in those situations. So uh, I want to clarify two things, right? So uh, so so first of all, is that uh, here we are talking about microstates, right? So a microstate is like basically a list. It can be understood a list of factors of where um, atoms are and what their velocities are. So uh, let's say the liquid phase. So a phase is a different concept. A phase would con contain many, many such microstates, right? So the, the concept of detailed balance uh, applies when we are talking about microstates. And it's also worth pointing out like detailed balance is like more like an assumption rather than like what happens in reality. It's sort of a assumption that enable us to do sampling, uh, particularly Monte Carlo sampling in an easy way. And the relay, uh, so, so uh, there's another, another thing like metropolis sampling is a special implementation of detailed balance. So there are many ways of realize, uh, there are many ways of design the moves that satisfy detailed balance. And metropolis sampling is a particular simple form. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. okay, so uh, back to, back to where we were. Um, so, so far I have talked about the classical system, the, the classical uh, free energy. And the classical term here apply, it, uh, applies, uh, refers to the fact that right, we are assuming that our particles uh, are, our nuclei are classical particles, they are point particles. And the point particles can be characterized by their center of mass in space. And, and that is sufficient. 
However, in reality, uh, many nuclei uh, that we have, especially the light ones such as hydrogen, helium, and lithium, they are sufficient light that uh, the classical particle treatment breaks down. And this is called the nuclear quantum effect. And the nuclear quantum effect affects, uh, uh, affects uh, many aspects of our uh, system. So it affects the particle momentum distribution and isotope fractionation. So isotope fractionation means that in different, for example, in different phases of water, the equilibrium concentration of deuterium or uh, oxygen 18 are different. Uh, in different phases. Yeah, it's different in gas phase, uh, in the liquid phase, and the ice phases. It affects the pH, heat capacity, diffusivity, uh, and many things. Right? A, 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 a nice uh, intuitive example of the differences that like uh, light water is perfectly drinkable, but heavy water uh, is poisonous at high doses. And uh, uh, how do we uh, take that into account in our simulation? So we use the uh, path integral uh, formalism. Uh, I left this slide uh, for reference, uh, also upload the slide to the website later. But this is uh, just uh, some, uh, uh, but, 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 but I'll uh, gloss, uh, gloss over them. But, uh, but, but the uh, essential idea is that because uh, the nuclei, they are not classical particles, right? So the momentum and kinetic uh, energy operator, they do not uh, commute. So, in re uh, so what do we do in practice? In order to compute the density of states, uh, we have to decompose the system into separate replicas and each replica would live in a much higher temperature because at the high temperature uh, limit, uh, the two operators becomes more commute. So uh, in practice, what we do is that we use the ring polymer molecular dynamics formalism is as I mentioned before, uh, instead of uh, having a nuclei as a classical particle, we represent each nuclei as many, many particles, and they are connected by the ring polymer, by a harmonic spring. So the total Hamiltonian of the system is the Hamiltonian of the uh, individual replicas and the harmonic springs that connect uh, the, the different, uh, the, like, so different replicas. Uh, now, uh, just to give an example of, uh, and, and just to give a, a more intuitive example, under the classical picture, we have the equipartition theorem. So, so we are saying each degrees of freedom, we have a kinetic energy of kBT divided by half, but because of the new quantum mechanical nature of our nuclei, this is not always true. So for example, in this water molecule, we have uh, three, uh, three modes uh, for the hydrogen. We have the oxygen and uh, we have the oxygen, hydrogen, and the bond vibration. And we have this uh, sort of the breathing mode and we have the out of plane vibration. Right. And because of the nuclear quantum effects, because of the zero point energy and so on, that each mole actually carries a kinetic energy that massively exceeds uh, a kBT half. And there are also different amount of quantum mechanical kinetic energy in each mole. Now, when we uh, try to characterize the free energy difference between the classical system to the quantum mechanical system, we can still use uh, the thermodynamic integration to, to, do, to perform a reversible switching between the classical and the quantum mechanical system. And in practice, when we write it, the expression down, this is uh, equal to uh, the, the, the integrand uh, is a function of this quantum mechanical kinetic energy, which we can compute from the ring polymer molecular dynamics. 
Okay, I, I, I saw no question in the in the Q&A, so I'll continue. So, so far we have talked about uh, atomistic modeling as well as a little bit of statistical mechanics. So the next part is that, so, so far, um, I think I have paint a, a pretty a grim picture about atomistic modeling. There are many parts that needs to be taken into consideration. And moreover, each step means a lot of computation, right? So thermodynamic integration is not cheap. Metadynamics simulation is not cheap. And if we want to consider nuclear quantum effects on top, because we need to not just simulate one system, but we need to simulate many copies, many replicas of the same system. And in, in there, we also increase the computational cost by uh, 20 times. Now, so here comes the machine learning part and how can machine learning help in this case? So first let's talk about representations. How do we represent our molecules? And we have many types of systems, right? So we have, uh, let's say a peptide, like a, a protein, or we can have a, a crystalline system with different arrangement, different uh, symmetry groups. Uh, or we can have also a box system with uh, certain defects is a little bit difficult. It's a, probably a dislocation somewhere. Uh, so, so usually the starting point is that instead of looking at all the atoms, instead, instead of looking at the bulk system, we first divide the system uh, into a set of atomic environments. And each atomic environment will be like, if I sit on a central atom and I cut off a, a sphere with a, a with a predefined uh, cutoff radius. And that is my atomic environment. And the reason why we want to do this uh, is because uh, imagine if you want to compare two systems with different number of atoms, and that, that is very difficult. Right. So by decomposing the system into a set of atomic environments, then we can focus on representing the atomic environments instead of a system with varying number of atoms. And there are many popular representations, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about. Now, the idea is that we first de do this decomposition and then any observable and, and, and any observable the, of the system, like let's say, uh, can be represented in terms of the local contributions. So let's say the phi here uh, is the descriptor, is the representation of the local environment. And then we can have an observable associated with this local environment. And, uh, uh, and, 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 the, and so for example, we can have an atomic energy that is uh, that is uh, characterized by the local environment and the total energy of our system can be expressed as the sum from local contributions. So let's dig further about this uh, local, how to represent local environment. So this is, uh, so this picture doesn't just apply for to representing materials and molecules, but it's a very general idea in machine learning. So in machine learning, in the, in the end of the day, we want a representation that tells us uh, how similar uh, our uh, samples are. Uh, we can uh, we can characterize the similarity in terms of the kernel matrix, uh, the K, or we can have a distance measurement. So the things that are similar have a, a kernel matrix, have a have a have a kernel that is high, that is close to one, and a distance, and they are very close in in our uh, distance space, and vice versa. So the idea is that we want to have these. Uh, kernel or uh, distance metric for our atomic environments. 
Now let's look at these two atomic environments and how do we compare them? Uh, so first of all, we can represent the atomic environment. So remember that we are sitting, uh, the center is an atom, right? We are sitting on an atom now. So we can characterize the local environment as a list of displacement vectors. So basically a list of uh, uh, like neighbors uh, and the displacement vectors characterizing these neighbors. Now, uh, so here's a question, right? So we have a list of neighbors. In this case, they're all hydrogen atoms. Imagine if I swap two hydrogen atoms, right? So the physical system doesn't change because the hydrogen atoms are indistinguishable to each other. However, if we look at the, this um, displacement vector, that changes, right? When you permute two atoms and we don't want that. So, so what we do is that instead of having this list of displacement vectors, we put a uh, smearing, we put a, a three-dimensional three Gaussian distribution on top of each atom, on top of each neighboring atom. So now instead of having a list of vectors, this uh, displacement vectors, now we have a density field. And the advantage is uh, immediate. Now, now like, uh, it doesn't matter when we swap two atoms, as long as they're of the same species. So now we can overlap these two density field and, uh, uh, and, and and then we compute the degree of overlap in order to characterize how similar these two atomic environments are. However, there's another problem, right? So if I rotate one of the molecules, it's still the same molecule, right? The physics doesn't change, but the integral would change. So how do we overcome that? How do we incorporate rotational invariance? So the trick here is that we not only compute the degree of overlap uh, for one particular orientation, but we do uh, but we do a rotation and we compute the average degree of overlap on all possible orientations. So in this way, we remove the rotational degree of freedom as well. Uh, so, uh, and, and you might have guessed uh, this integral is quite unpleasant to evaluate for uh, each pair of atomic environments, right? Suppose you have N atomic environments, then like computing this guy for between each pair was, it would be have a quadratic scaling and that is not ideal. However, uh, like Albert and, and, and Gabo and uh, Rishi, uh, they, they found uh, they have a very nice uh, formalism to show that one can actually express uh, this, we can compute very efficiently this kernel, this similarity by expanding the individual row, this density field in terms of uh, spherical harmonics. Uh, and, and then like computing the, the K here would be some, uh, would amount to some simple operation using the spherical harmonics coefficients. Now, so far we, we are talking about the atomic environment, right? But we are interested, eventually we're interested in, in bulk materials. So what happens there is that um, we can, if we need to combine the uh, atomic descriptors into a global descriptor. And, and there are many ways of uh, uh, doing this. Uh, and the easiest is that, okay, I can just take the global descriptor, the global feature by taking the average uh, of uh, the individual uh, contribution from each atomic environment. So that's the simplest thing we can do. Uh, obviously there are many other choices available. Okay, so now I think it's a good time to stop, uh, ask uh, and, and answer some questions. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, Oscar asked, so 
the atomic environment is somehow like an application of the renormalization group, isn't it? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, but 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 then I'm, I'm not an expert in renormalization group. There could be a way of uh, e expressing atomic environment as such. Uh, I, I do not know. Um, and, and, and then it's a question, does local environment means up to nearest neighbors? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, the, the local environment is taking the nearest, uh, it's taking, uh, no, so, sorry, sorry. So depending on how you define nearest neighbor, right? So typically we take a cutoff. Right, and usually uh, you can go to the first neighbor shell. You can go to the second neighbor shell. Uh, it's really up to you. It doesn't have to be the first neighbor shell, but it is the nearest uh, atoms within a certain cutoff. And then there's uh, and then the slope. Okay, so so. Uh, there's an anonymous uh, question here. So how large should be the variance of the Gaussian kernel associated with uh, each particle? And, and this is a fantastic question uh, because um, it, it, it actually is actually uh, very deep. So uh, intuitively, the, the sharper the, 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 the Gaussian that you use, uh, the, the let's say um, the more sensitive your kernel matrix, uh, your kernel measurement is uh, for atomic environments. Imagine if two atomic environments differ very slightly, but if you use a very sharp Gaussian, then, then you are still not getting uh, close to one when you compute uh, the similarity. Uh, so, Intuitively, that would be a good thing, right? Because you want some, uh, you want the measurement that is as uh, accurate, as sensitive as possible. However, uh, in reality, this is not the case because uh, eventually we need to use our representations to do some uh, machine learning, to do some uh, regression. So in, in that way, we want to incorporate a little bit more smoothness into our uh, representation. So, uh, in, in, so, so it's, a, it's a balance between the two. Uh, so okay. So, uh, so there's another question about uh, what about interactions between atomic environments? Simple summing means they they do not interact, and 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 that would be a, a correct statement. However, when it comes to machine learning potential, the architecture is actually more complicated, and we do consider uh, interaction. Um, okay, I, 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 I think I'll stop now, uh, I'll stop the, 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 the questions now in the interest of time and, and move a little before. If there are uh, other questions, we can also answer them. Uh, other like questions that are not addressed at the end of the talk, I'll answer them uh, during the last part. Okay, so we talk about representation. Now we can uh, use this representation, and and a simple uh, and and a sim uh, and there are many uh, many ways how we can use them. Uh, we can build a low dimensional map using dimensionality reduction, so we can uh, visualize our system. Um, uh, and we can do some pre-processing and uh, sparsifying the data set. We can do clustering or we can do regression. So I'll talk about uh, this dimensionality reduction. So the dimensionality reduction at its core is basically I have a high dimensional data and I want to find a low dimensional representation that best preserve uh, the relationship uh, between the high dimensional data. Notice that the terminology I'm using here is kind of vague and uh, this is intentionally so. Uh, 
because depending on how you define uh, this, what kind of relationship you want to preserve, you basically ended up uh, with different dimensionality reduction algorithm. So the more, more popular ones are PCA. And if you do it in the kernel matrix, it's called kernel PCA, like TISNI and UMAP is getting very popular these days. So I just talk about the PCA principal component analysis because it's really like sort of the mother of uh, all the other dimensionality algorithms and the principle are usually pretty similar. So the question is like, what is preserved? What is this relationship that I have talked about that is preserved uh, during the PCA analysis? So in this simple example, I have two dimensional data, F1 of principal component, L1 and L2, and I project the data set onto this uh, first principal component. Now uh, in, in PCA, um, we first uh, we have the data in the high dimension. I have the data in the low dimension. So what are, uh, so this is all about the covariance uh, of the data. So I'm trying to uh, preserve this covariance, which can be expressed by uh, T transpose, uh, sorry, X transpose times X in the high dimension and the same at the low dimension. Now, mathematically, one can show that uh, this can simply be done by finding the uh, first d, uh, small d uh, eigenvectors of the big uh, C covariance matrix coming from the high dimensional data. And these uh, eigenvectors are sorted uh, like uh, with a descending value of eigenvalues. So we are looking for the eigenvectors like the eigenvectors that are associated with the largest eigenvalues. And, and, and uh, uh, so this is just a little bit of a derivation. And, and of course we can find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, just by uh, if, using the uh, symbol uh, linear algebra tricks by solving the, the by determinant becomes zero. Now, uh, so graphically, uh, so let's, let, let's look at this uh, graphics again. So we are looking at L1 uh, and, and L2 uh, that preserves the covariance of our data. And this can be done, of course, can be done in higher dimension and just a simple illustration on how this happens in 3D. We take the uh, two principal components and project it down. Now we have returned this uh, simple Python package that does uh, this analysis uh, automatically. So this can be just be called using uh, a simple bash uh, command line. So you use uh, one bash command and then you are able to generate uh, the, uh, a low dimensional map as well as do some other analysis automatically. So these are the selected uh, uh, bash command that one might want to use. So here just show some examples. So uh, here's, here's a alanine dipeptide. And typically people uh, try, try to visualize the system using the Raman Chengen plot. So using two dihedral angles, uh, phi and shy. Uh, we can also do this, this type of analysis automatically uh, using the ASAP package. And we can see we came up with something that is quite similar to the Raman Chengen plot. So we have the principal component one and principal component two. Uh, and uh, uh, but, but however, remember that we didn't know a priori uh, like dihedral angles are important. You don't need a prior knowledge uh, to come up with such uh, automated map. Uh, here's another example. Here I'm showing like this kind of map can distinguish a classical water and water that is from with nuclear quantum effects. 
And then we uh, there's also a projection of the Q and nine data set, and the map is on, uh, able to distinguish small molecules with different compositions or like branch molecules or long carbon chain. Okay, so uh, I'm wondering should okay. Um, there's still this last part of machine learning potential and 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 as i expected the lot uh, so this part is a little bit longer than the second part so maybe i'll stop now and talk about machine learning potential during the second lecture and now i'll answer uh, any of the remaining questions for the first two parts so uh BB uh, asks a question, right? BB, do you want to ask this alive? Hi, so I, uh, Hi, uh, I just wanted to ask one question. Uh, what decides the uh, which representation of molecules uh, we should uh, choose? On what basis do we choose the representation of molecules? Right. So the SOAP representations that I introduced, uh, introduced earlier has this advantage that it's completely general. You can use this uh, for uh, any so these are all generated with the soap representation and they are very different class of materials. So it's sort of uh, applicable uh, to many, many things and we don't have to think, right? And of course, there's the option of uh, handcraft uh, representations. This is often done in the uh, chem informatics uh, community. Uh, this, uh, the handcraft representations has the advantage that you can incorporate your prior physical understanding of the system, right? Because uh, when we think about it, we can also think the dihedral angles phi and shy to be the representations of our system, right? And by using like phi and psi, uh, we are incorporating our prior knowledge about the peptides. We know that dihedral angles are often important to characterize these systems. And we know the position of side chains are probably not as important. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. And, and, and the Lavi also asked a question. Uh, I'll, I'll read it out uh, instead. So how do we go about large order interaction in atomic environment case? And how do we uh, incorporate it? So the answer is uh, typically uh, people do not in incorporate it. So uh, there are some ongoing work uh, from uh, Michele Ceriotti, from York Baylor, that they have certain scheme of uh, incorporating the long range interaction. But uh, as of today, this is not the norm. So typically people do not, which is a little bit of a shame. But surprisingly, uh, without accounting for long range interaction, the machine learning framework seems to be rather accurate for many things. Hello. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I had a question. So while you were explaining about the, the PCA, mm -hmm. uh, about the data uh, there, so I was just uh, wondering if the data there has something to do with the information which you explained in the last slide about the atomic environment case, where we have this uh, information about this displacement vector. And uh, yeah, so is it uh, somewhere related to this PCA uh, data set? So that uh, now in this PCA analysis, uh, what we do is now we have this information of this atomic environment. Mm -hmm. so is it uh, something like this? I just wanted to uh, relate it with the previous slide. Uh, so, so which uh, do you have a, a slide number that uh, we can oh. refer to? Uh, 
Ah, okay, so you were explaining about the... We have PC. The, uh, okay, I actually didn't look it. Yeah, maybe before this one. Oh, well. Uh, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, you talk about this data set where... Uh, uh, and I think this data set you explained in the previous slide to this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here, yeah, you were explaining yeah, uh, these data points. So mm -hmm. I was uh, wondering if these data points were somewhere related to this, uh, in the previous case, to this in, uh, atom, uh, the, the information of the atomic environment. Right, right. So, um, so the, it, this depends on, uh, so the, let me explain uh, this example. Uh, so let's say, in this example, mm -hmm. uh, each point represents a particular uh, dipeptide, alanine dipeptide configuration. Okay. So what we what, what actually happens is that we take each configuration of the molecule, right, and then we compute uh, we compute the description for each of its atomic environment, right? And from there, uh, we compute the global descriptor for this small molecule, right? In this case, by taking the average of the atomic con uh, contribution. Now, so, so, so now I have a vector for each molecule in my data set, right? Now, uh, let's say I, if I have uh, 10,000 molecules in my data set, right? So now I have a 10,000 by the dimension, dimensionality of the descriptor matrix, right? Mm -hmm. And then I project this, that, that matrix down in two dimensions. Okay, okay. And that's what we see here. So each point represent the low dimensional representation, the 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 two D coordinate of the of the design matrix uh, of the vector for a small molecule. Ah. Okay. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I think we are a little bit over time. I think we can take the break now. And when we come back, I'll go through the machine learning potential as well as some applications. Yes, uh, let's take how much do you want to break? So uh, on the schedule it says a 15 minute break, Perfect. right? Maybe we come back at uh, 2.15. Perfect, let's back to 15. Thank you. Thank you.
I think we will give people one, two minutes to <laughs> come back and then you can continue with the, yeah. the lecture. Let me start showing my screen. Yeah, thank you. I think almost all people is there, so whenever you want. Right, so I'll slowly start. So I hope people had a chance to, to grab, grab a nice coffee. Uh, so just to a brief recap, so we talk about atomistic simulations and we talk about translating uh, materials and molecules into design matrices using representations. Now it's the machine learning potential part. Uh, so the machine learning potential uh, basically is rumored to be this device that have the accuracy, that has the accuracy on par with initial methods, but at a cost that is just a little bit higher than force fields. Um, so so uh, to put it uh, uh, like, it, to compare it with density functional theory. So the density functional theory can handle hundreds of atoms on a time scale of picoseconds. And with the machine learning potentials, uh, we can do much, much more. This is mostly because of the favorable linear scaling uh, compared with the cubic scaling uh, in the case of uh, DFD. And uh, we can, uh, I often run it just on a laptop. Now, uh, so how does it work? So first of all, I would like to use a black box view, uh, this black box view. So we have uh, certain configurations uh, of atoms in our training set. We label them, uh, meaning we compute the energy and forces using DFT, although it can be, be uh, other electronic structure methods. And then we feed this information uh, to the neural network, although it could be also a Gaussian process or something else. And then when the new configurations come in, then the machine learning, uh, the, the machine learning model can give us a speedy uh, predictions of the energy and forces associated with these new structures. And of course, uh, the black box view may not be very satisfying to you. So here's an alternative view that starts from the atomic environments. So if I invite you to look at these two uh, configurations here, right? What do you see? And, and your answer might be that, okay, on the right, we have like a solid like configuration on, on the left, this looks amorphous. And the reason why you think uh, this guy here looks like a solid, it's because if we look in the, uh, if we look at individual atomic environments, if we sit on an atom and look at our neighborhood, we see very similar atomic environments over and over again. Uh, in this case, it's FCC. Now, actually, even within the liquid, we have these uh, similar atomic environments. Uh, it's very hard to see, but, 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 but it's there. We can even uh, find solid-like environments in the liquid. I'll elaborate this point later when we move on to the examples. And of course, uh, this is very hard to identify using naked eye, and therefore uh, we rely on these popular representations, including the SOAP re representations that we have talked about during the previous lecture to characterize the atomic environments so we can compare them. So what does it mean in practice that we have similar atomic environments over and over again? 
This means that if we compute all the configurations using a uh, quantum mechanical methods, it's quite wasteful. The reason for that is that, so if we take the uh, locality, if we take the nearsightedness approximation, if we assume the energy uh, of associated with each environment is almost almost completely determined by the environment itself, by, its, uh, by, by the nearest neighbors. Then we encounter these environments over and over again. So, but each time, if we have to recompute them by solving quantum mechanics, that doesn't seem too wise. So we can. So what we can do instead is that we, um, in our memory, we have. Uh, uh, if we have a collection of atomic environments and the together with the energy and forces associated with these environments. So we have this in our memory and when a new configuration comes in, when new environment comes in, we can just compare this new environment to the existing ones in our memory and then give a, and, and give a prediction. So to summarize, to construct a machine learning potential, we basically follow a two-step process. I mean, regardless of what kind of machine learning algorithm or what kind of representation that you actually use, we first collect a bunch of environments uh, and then we do a uh, interpolation, right? So that basically sums up the machine learning potential. And with that, I would like to uh, move on uh, to, um, uh, to the, the, the applications. So let me share my screen again. Okay, cool. Applications. Uh, the system of water. So this is a ubiquitous system, uh, but the system of water has many mysterious properties that we often take for granted. So for example, the ice floats on water. And that's quite unusual because uh, typically we think solid to be often denser than the liquid. And the liquid water is densest at four degrees Celsius. There's also a significant uh, difference between heavy water and light water. We have many ice faces, uh, at least 18 of them. And uh, one of the mystery, one of uh, another mystery is that we have two uh, polymorphs, ambient pressure polymorphs. We have the hexagonal ice, 1H, and the uh, cubic ice, uh, 1C. Right. So uh, energetically speaking, the, the, the en enthalpy of them are basically degenerate. However, in nature, we only see hexagonal ice. That's why all the snowflakes are hexagonal. Uh, and why is that? So uh, we trained a machine learning potential. This is trained uh, based on the hybrid DFT, rep B0 plus uh, the D3 dispersion correction. Uh, we train using the Baylor Polynello Neural Network, and there are about like thousand, like a thousand five hundred configurations in the training set, both uh, the energy and forces. The training set is publicly available, and you are more than welcome to look at it and play with it. So this is the standard uh, forty-five degree line that all the machine learning work show. And, and then we can use the, the machine learning potential to do actual uh, simulation. So here I'm showing the density isobar uh, for three phases of water. We have the liquid showing in red. This is from simulation, as well as the cubic ice and hexagonal ice. Cubic ice and hexagonal ice have the same volume. Now, let's first look at the water. We have two lines here. So what are they? So the dashed line is from a classical simulations treating nuclei as classical particles. And uh, the solid line is accounting for uh, nuclear quantum effects that we have explained before. 
uh, using the path integral molecular dynamics formulas. So you see, actually, the nuclear quantum effects makes uh, liquid water a little bit denser by about 1%. Uh, and also for ice, it makes ice a little bit denser. That's quite counterintuitive. We also capture the density maximum of liquid water very nicely at about like four degrees Celsius. So the experimental results are marked here using the stars. Uh, we are just a, a, a couple of percent within the experimental, uh, the experimental uh, observation. And here I show the radial distribution function, oxygen, 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 hydrogen, and hydrogen, hydrogen. And again, from a classical molecular dynamic simulations, as well as the path integral molecular dynamic simulations. So for oxygen, oxygen, like, uh, the nuclear quantum effects doesn't play an important role. But for the oxygen, hydrogen, and hydrogen, hydrogen, we really have to turn on the nuclear quantum effects to match uh, very nicely the experimental observation. Now, just a brief recap of uh, thermodynamic integration. And again, I got the sign wrong here. This should be uh, flipped. So uh, in, in reality, uh, in, in practice, what we do is like we do a thermodynamic integration from a harmonic system uh, to a classical system. Uh, this is the first step of the integration. And then we, we do the integration from the classical system to the nuclear, uh, uh, to the quantum mechanical nuclei, uh, considering nuclear quantum effects. So, uh, so as a reminder, like for this last step, we are just integrating uh, using the quantum mechanical kinetic energy. Now I'm going to show something that uh, often make people feel uncomfortable. So uh, I compute the, the classical uh, chemical potential difference between the aforementioned ice I see the cubic ice and hexagonal ice. And I'm, I did that using two different fits of the neural network potential. And you can see the results are different, right? They are not just uh, quantitatively different and you can see the sign is different. Although like arguably uh, the, the, the energy scale here is very small. So we are looking at milli electron volts uh, per molecule. But still, this kind of tells us just using the machine learning potential may not be able to capture the very fine uh, difference uh, between free energies. So what do we do? So and to, to present this uh, sort of schematically, so this is the problem that we have. So we have a potential energy surface, which is our ground truth, which is DFT in this case. And then we have the machine learning potential, uh, potential energy surface. Now, they two are very, very similar, but there will inevitably be some small differences, right? And, uh, and, and the difference may come from different reasons. So for example, the machine learning potential doesn't incorporate long range interaction, but obviously uh, it, it's there. Uh, and, and the difference may also come from maybe the training set is a little bit sparse at certain points. Right, and then there's also uh, the this residue difference uh, because of the fit. Now, how do we promote the machine learning potential results to the DFT level? How do we do this uh, correction? And we not just want to do this correction for a particular configuration, but for all the relevant configurations. So to write down this uh, mathematically, we can write down the Gibbs free energy of the system described by DFT. So this is the log of the partition function. And we can do the same for the machine learning potential. Now, the difference between the actual uh, chemical Gibbs free energy and the machine learning one can be 
written in this uh, free energy perturbation form. So we are taking the average of the exponential of the difference between uh, the ensemble as different uh, ensemble average of the exponential of the difference for each configuration. So typically, uh, free energy perturbation converge rather uh, horribly. However, uh, in this case, because the two potential energy surfaces are very, very similar, uh, we can actually converge this estimator uh, very rapidly. Uh, typically, we use like uh, less than 100 configuration. So we compute this term for different phases of water under different thermodynamic conditions. Here I divide the Gibbs free energy by the number of molecules so we can plot out the chemical potential. So the, uh, the difference is small, right? On the order of uh, one milli electron volts uh, per molecule. But this makes a difference. After I put this correction term back on top, uh, this uh, graph that I showed before, the chemical potential difference between cubic ice and cathogen ice, then I'm getting converged results. The predictions from after a correctum, the predictions using two fits of neural network are consistent. So to uh, summarize, uh, the, here's the workflow of the initial thermodynamics. So the first part is what we have talked about before. We do a thermodynamic integration to compute the classical and quantum mechanical free energies. And then in the end, we always add a correction term on top to promote the neural network to the initial level of theory. So here are the results. We have the cubic ice and we have the hexagonal ice. We compute the neural network results. We add the correction and then we add nuclear quantum effects. So here we can see nuclear quantum effects actually has a major effect. It significantly stabilized hexagonal ice to make it ever so slightly more stable than the cubic one. So without nuclear quantum effects, maybe the snowflake that we, we see in nature will not have this a nice hexagonal shape. Uh, and another one is the chemical potential difference between ice and liquid water. And we compute it using umbrella sampling uh, on, on like coexistence systems. We first compute the neural network results and the same story. We correct it to the TFT level and we add nuclear quantum effects. Uh, we can even consider not just uh, H2O, but D2O, the heavy water as well. Now, uh, also the, to compare with the experiments, and we can see we are really uh, within like a hair uh, compared with experiments. And not just that, the, even the difference between the melting point of D2O and H2O, we can predict that uh, very accurately as well. And notice that the um, D2O and classical water, which is the red line, uh, and uh, the green line for the D2O here uh, almost overlap. So the classical water and D2O have the same chemical potential. And why is that? This is because when we doing when we were doing the thermodynamic integration, and we look at the the integrand, there's actually a, a, a reversal of uh, this integral. So there's a little bit of cancellation of nuclear quantum. Effect. So this is for water. And next example is on hydrogen. And then we will also dig a little bit deeper on this locality argument on this near sightedness. So for hydrogen, uh, hydrogen is the dominant component in the center of uh, giant planets such as uh, Jupiter. So what happens is like on the surface, uh, the pressure uh, is low and the uh, hydrogen it takes the familiar uh, dimolecular form. Uh, it, 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 uh, and, and, but as we approach the center, the, the pressure goes up and uh, the hydrogen starts to dissociate. They become uh, atomic 
as well as metallic. So experimentally, this is very difficult to prove. So uh, this is a, a deeply controversial topic of uh, where, on, uh, on what, under what pressure and temperature does this transition from molecular hydrogen to a uh, metallic hydrogen happen, as well as the nature of this transition, if it's like first order or, uh, or smooth transition. So using uh, DFT molecular dynamics, like this transition, because we are restricted to the small system and relatively short simulation time, the transition uh, can mostly only be a uh, probe from this uh, kink on the equation of states. However, with the neural network potential, we are able uh, to scan the whole phase diagram. And, and so here I'm showing the uh, the, the color scale here is the average order parameter. Here is defined by the fraction of the bonded hydrogen. So here at uh, low pressure, low temperature, we have mostly molecular hydrogen. And at higher pressure and higher temperature, uh, we have uh, atomic hydrogen. Now this black line here is the melting line uh, that we have computed. And then the purple line and uh, the orange line here are the location of the density maxima and the heat capacity maxima. So that is if we plot out the density and the heat capacity of the system uh, under uh, isobar conditions, and then we trace the location of the maxima and we plot on the phase diagram. So, so that, that is the purple and uh, the orange line here. Now, from this graph, uh, the transition looks smooth, but we want to characterize it a little bit more. And we explain the system in terms of a, a regular solution model. So in this picture, we are saying that, um, uh, we're saying like the system can be understood as the mixture of two liquids, like the atomic liquid and the molecular liquid. So in the regular solution model that some of us might have studied during the undergrad, the total uh, gives free energy of the system as, the, uh, as a function of the fraction of one of the component can be written as the, uh, the sum of the chemical potential uh, from this component and a mixing entropy. Right, so this is the mixing entropy as well as an enthalpic penalty of mixing. So uh, it, you, under this regular solution model, when the temperature is high, uh, our system uh, mix perfectly. Uh, when the temperature, uh, but, but when the temperature is below the critical point, then the two liquids phase separate. So now the game is that we want to compute this free energy profile for our system so we can understand it, we can fit it to the regular solution model. So we did just that. Uh, we computed uh, the free energy profile as molecular, as the function of molecular fraction using metadynamic simulations. And then we fit this profile, free energy profile to the regular model, regular solution model and get the parameters as well as the critical point. So here's the critical point that we have located. Yeah. It's uh, just uh, on the melting line. So above the melting line, the system is super critical according to us. And not just that, uh, the machine learning potential also correctly captured the ground state crystal structure at different pressure. So solid hydrogen is known to be very complicated and uh, it can form uh, many, many, many polymorphs at low temperature and different pressure. And the melting line also looks okay compared with previous experimental measurements. Okay, so uh, the extent of, is there any questions yes. related? Yes. Could you replay the questions? I think now is the moment. Yes. Okay, so 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 there's a question uh, from an 
Andre, uh, maybe like does Andre want to speak up? Hi. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, so you were talking uh, sort of in the big beginning of the second section that for the uh, neural networks, we essentially collect the different environments and then use them to essentially estimate the energy instead of recalculating the environments again and again. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if in that data set that you collect, you collect specifically the environments for single molecules or if you're storing the snapshots of a system, say at particular temperature or whatnot. So, right. But, yeah. but, but. so the systems in the training set are all bulk structures. Okay. So in this particular case, uh, they are all configurations from liquid water. And the reason behind that, I'll actually uh, explain uh, in a bit. Okay, thank you. And uh, and, and then like uh, there's a question from Yu Xie. Uh, do you want to speak up? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I want to ask that uh, is the correction to the machine learning model, uh, the term uh, U minus UML uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. is it from training a residual uh, neural network? Um, uh, so uh, in principle, I think one can do that. Uh, I, I, I I have, but I I also have seen people who train the difference, not between the neural network and the DFT, but they train a difference between two different levels of electronic structure calculation. Let's say you can train a difference between a hybrid DFT and a PBE, for example. I have seen that. So in principle, uh, it is possible, although, but, but, I, but are you thinking about training the difference in potential energy surface or training the difference in, in the free energy difference? Because they are different, right? One is a high dimensional object and the other is a, a number, is, is a scalar as a function of pressure and temperature. Um, okay, so here um, you might, uh, require the DFT calculation for this correction term. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Or maybe I, my understanding is, uh, is kind of wrong. So uh, I can explain in practice how this is done. Right? Mm -hmm. So in practice, what we do is that at a certain thermodynamic condition, let's say I'm interested in this correction term at 300 Kelvin and one gigapascal, right? So I run MD simulation using the machine learning potential at that condition, and I collect on correlated configurations, right? And then I put these selected configurations generated from the machine learning Hamiltonian back to DFT. So I can compute this difference and uh, from which I compute this delta mu. I see, I see. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, maybe like I'll, I'll take uh, one more question uh, from Christian, uh, from Christian. I want to ask uh, between the PBE and b 12 lip functional, which describe the best parameter for machine learning potential? 
uh, th so this is uh, it, this depends on the on the system. So, uh, so 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 there are two things here, right? So this the underlying uh, electronic structure calculation, right? So for all the machine learning fits, it's garbage in, garbage out. If the underlying theory is not great, then obviously we won't have a good machine learning potential. Right. So the first step is always to uh, benchmark uh, DFD so that we we select a good reference, right? So another uh, uh, so another uh, thing is that uh, uh, like so the selection is not always possible. So for water is clearer which function is better. For high pressure hydrogen, it's a little bit of a uh, guesswork. Now uh, so. And then once we select the, the underlying theory, then the, the question is about the quality of the fit. And, and, and as of now, this is still a little bit of art and one needs to validate and refine the potential and so on. Thank you. Okay. So, so, so for now, I'll move back uh, to the talk. Uh, this, this last part about uh, uh, this argument of locality because we were explaining everything in terms of atomic environments, right? We stressed this concept over and over again, but how good is it uh, as an approximation? So how local things are. So we are going to explore uh, this problem. So again, this is just brief recap. Machine learning potential starts from atomic environment and uh, each atomic environment gives us atomic energy and we sum this up to get the total energy of our system, right? So let's look at the atomic energy. So here I'm plotting out on the X and Y axis, I'm plotting out the atomic energies uh, from two different machine learning potential. So this is for the water. And, and they are not correlated at all. So at first I thought, okay, this is maybe due to how the energy is partitioned between oxygen and hydrogen. So now I'm comparing the molecular energies, which is the sum of the atomic energy of oxygen and hydrogen in each water molecule from the two fits of the machine learning potential. Still, they are not Related. And this basically tells us that the atomic energy uh, that, that we rely on very heavily in machine learning potential is really a mathematical device. It doesn't really uh, carry a deep uh, physical, uh, rel physical meaning. Now, the reason why I started looking into this is because uh, back then I, I was thinking about the problem of heat conductivity, which is, uh, uh, so heat conductivity is a very important parameter that goes into the power system. It's also a sort of input parameter for fluid dynamics and uh, other type of continuum modeling. Now, uh, the way of the typical way of computing the heat conductivity is to use the green kubo relationship, which is basically from the, uh, by taking the integral of the autocorrelation function of heat flux. Now, what is the problem here? So the integral costs to integrate to infinite time, but we know that uh, if we take the autocorrelation, there's always a noise, there's a Gaussian noise. So if you actually integrate to infinite time, uh, the, 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 the uh, sum is divergent. But if you cut off uh, prematurely, and if the signal does have a long decaying tail, then you put a bias on your estimate. And moreover, uh, the computational heat flux as for the atomic energy that we have talked about and also a pairwise force, uh, pairwise forces between pairs of atoms. So none of these are well defined uh, in the machine learning potential setting as well as in many other settings as well. Okay, so luckily we, we've actually found a formulation that allows us to compute heat conductivity independent 
from the green cobalt relation, independent from the heat flux. So how it works is that we have this particle density field, right? So this is a well-defined quantity. And then we do a Fourier expansion of this term in space uh, to give us this rho tilt, uh, that is uh, for uh, at each wave vector k. Now, uh, if you do some hydrodynamics uh, equation, which uh, my math was not good enough to do that, but these things were solved uh, in the 60s uh, by, by fluid dynamics people. Now, it turns out the autocorrelation function of this rho tilt has uh, two modes. So there's one mode that is actually an exponentially decay mode, which is uh, the heat mode that carries the information of the heat conductivity. And the second mode is actually an auxiliary mode that uh, is, is related to the sound uh, propagation. Uh, so here's the hydrodynamic equation, uh, which I will skip. So, uh, and then I, we did just that. We computed the, so first of all, we want to do some benchmark. So we benchmark on the Leonard Jones because for Leonard Jones is a pairwise potential and we can compute that, compute the heat conductivity uh, very easily using the green cobalt relation. We compute the autocorrelation function and we fit to the hydrodynamic expression. You can see the fit and the simulation, uh, actual simulation are basically overlap perfectly. And we can also look at the power spectrum. From power spectrum, we see two peaks. Uh, the first peak is the exponential heat mode that we talk about, and the second peak is the sun propagation. And then we compute the heat conductivity from at different kappa, and then we extrapolate that to k equal to zero, which is the microscopic heat conductivity, which can also be computed from the green cobalt relationship. And they agree. We do this at different thermodynamic conditions. So basically this, what we call the wave method, gives consistent estimate with green cobalt for Leonard Jones at many different conditions. Uh, so with that, we can use this method. Uh, with such validation, we can use this method for other systems. So for example, uh, we computed the heat conductivity of the high pressure hydrogen. Uh, again, we compute the autocorrelation function. And, and from there, we extract out the heat conductivity. OK, so for the last part, so this is a little bit uh, uh, bittersweet story. But uh, the next example may build you more confidence about the locality of the machine learning potential. So this is related to the question uh, has been previously asked. So what is in the training set? We have the bulk liquid uh, water in the training set of the machine learning potential. And but remember that we actually use the model to, uh, com uh, to compute for cubic ice and hexagonal ice, and they work fine. So I was thinking, like, how, uh, how much can we extrapolate from this machine learning potential? Is it applicable to other ice phases as well? So we took from this study uh, that has uh, that that collected many ice phases, some uh, actual experimentally confirmed ones, like uh, uh, all the experimentally confirmed ones, as well as many hypothetical ones. So they plot, they did this map using sketch map. You can also uh, do a PCA map of the ice phases. And then we took, uh, we took the representative 54 phases of ice, and then, uh, using the same framework that we have talked about, we compare them with the liquid water configurations uh, in our training set. Now you can see ice and water, they appear at different places on our PCA map, which is understandable, they should be different. However, the interesting thing is that if we instead do not compare the global structures, but instead just projecting down the atomic environments, we found out the local environments in liquid water completely, almost completely covers the environments that we encounter in the 54 ice phases. 
So what does this mean? This means that uh, we have the all the we have collected all the relevant atomic environments for these ice phases. Although our training set are completely built on liquid water, so because of that. This machine learning potential trained on liquid water is able to predict various properties such as density, lattice energy, as well as the phonon density of states. So for, these are 54 phases and we can zoom in to look at individual ones and uh, for each one the agreement is magnificent. And and because of uh, and because of that, we are also able to use this machine learning potential to compute the phase diagram of water, right? Uh, so we have the again we have the machine learning prediction, but we always add the correction terms on top, and uh, we can choose not to correct it to the. Uh, Raf B zero D three, which is the theory that we use to fit the machine learning potential, we can also correct it to a different DFT levels theory, such as P B zero D three and B three lip D three. Right, those gave they gave different, uh, slightly different phase diagram. And over, overall, the agreement with experiment is very good. It's like better than the existing empirical water potential. Uh, and again, nuclear quantum effects here play a very important role to shift uh, the boundary around. Uh, and, and, and that's basically it. So the take home message here would be that uh, um, machine learning potential is a very powerful tool. Now we can compute the initial phase diagram. Uh, we, there are still a lot of things we do not fully understand about machine learning potential, and there are, uh, I think there will be a lot going on in that direction, particularly for the long range interaction. And then uh, it's probably also a good time to revise uh, the typical simulation, the typical tools that we use uh, to better utilize the, 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 the like state of the art machine learning potential. And with that, that's the end of my talk. And I would like to answer uh, more questions. Okay, so uh, back, back to the Q and A. Um, so there's a question from uh, Mahamud. Hi. Hello. Uh, uh, I wanted to know, uh, uh, is this uh, correction to MLP uh, just for uh, light elements because of uh, nuclear motion? Mm. Thank you. So, so they are actually two separate uh, things, right? So, uh, Nuclear quantum effects correction is needed for light elements, right? So imagine if you run an initial MD simulation, you still need to consider nuclear quantum effects. Now, uh, the correction term is needed uh, if you want to correct the residue error in your machine learning potential. And that error is because your potential energy surface is slightly different from your ground truth. And that is a fact, regardless if you run MD simulation or path integral molecular dynamic simulation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then there's a question from uh, William. William, could you please turn on the, your audio? Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry. Um, if I understood correctly, uh, when you were trying to train the neural network 
on the data, you need to define some local environments for the particles that, that seems to be very similar across the sample. What will happen when you have a phase transition where the local environments can be really large? How can you define that kind of local environment? Right. So uh, thanks for the question. So 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 uh, so the in practice, how do we decide the local environment is a little bit by a uh, trial and error. So what you do it so uh, it's there's a trade off, right? So if you select a smaller environment, then uh, the neural network is little. Uh, it's much cheaper to be or train and to use. Right, but when you select a larger environment, that gives you more uh, long, long, long range interaction, but it's also more expensive to train and to use. Right, so in practice, what we do is I always select different local environment and train the network uh, separately using them and see what happens and pick an optimal uh, combination. Now, related to your question of the phase transition, right? So uh, personally, I'm not sure if phase transition would dramatically change the use of the size of atomic environment. So for example, in this case of liquid water, we always use six angstrom for our cutoff throughout. And uh, uh, as the, in my previous talk, we have shown like the liquid water, uh, the machine learning potential describe both liquid water and ice phases very well. Thank you, and thank you for the very interesting talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, I think we are a little bit, one minute over time, maybe I take two more questions and, and... okay, like, uh, so there's a question from, uh, Horn, if if that's how the name is pronounced. Yes. Juan, we cannot listen to you. I think maybe you can read the questions because okay. Juan is on mute, but. Okay, can... I'll do that. So Juan asks, when our results do, don't fully coincide with experiments, can we reverse engineer the neural network potential to reconstruct the neighboring environment? I'm thinking about a distribution function or a GOVAR or, or something like that. I, so, so from what I understood from this question, right? So this, there, there's a residue uh, difference uh, between the machine learning prediction and, and experiments. Um, which come from different reasons. The most important reason probably being that uh, the DFT functional that we use involve uh, approximations, right? So I do think there, there will be a lot of opportunity to add another correction term on top of machine learning potential to make it match experiments a, a little bit better. Now, I don't think this has been done before, although in principle, since that people routinely do that when they build force fields for uh, proteins and RNAs and DNAs, um, I think this seems to be possible, although I haven't seen anything in that direction yet. Oh, okay, so uh, let's take... Uh, one last question from uh, Robson. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. I'm, I'm just wondering, since we can map the phase diagrams, if we can also determine the nature of the phase boundaries. From the MLPs. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, so, so uh, so first of all, I'm I'm a very uh, cautious. Uh, I, I I personally, I'm a little bit on the cautious side, right? So when you say the boundary of the the uh, so the nature of the phase transition, so in the in the case of ice and liquid water, so this is uh, when we go from one phase to the other, this is typically through nucleation. Right, so there will be an interface uh, between ice and liquid, for example. Now, I, intuitively, I think if you have an interface, long range interactions gonna be more important compared with if we just have the bulk phases, right? So I think there, there uh, because the machine learning potential is short range, so. Uh, I, I feel a little bit uneasy to use the machine learning potential to characterize an uh, interfacial phenomenon, although maybe it's not a problem. So, th so that's my sense. Thank you. Thank you. Being, uh, as you prefer, you can go ahead. We have time on Zoom, but if you cannot continue, we can stop here. So, uh, oh, okay, so maybe like uh, another uh, two more questions as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let's see. Uh... Okay, so there's a question from, uh... I, I, I'm sorry if I, I, I will mispronounce your name. Uh, my Tane. Ah, okay. My Tane, yes. Uh, hi, uh, you actually answered my, my question. I had some uh, Zoom problems, but you, you went on, on that uh, later, so thank you. Okay, good. And then there's a question from Mauricio. I hope nobody is keeping a scoreboard to see how many names I have mispronounced today. Let's see if Mauricio turns on <laughs> and meet. Mauricio, you should unmute yourself. Okay. He's not replaying, so let's read yourself. Your uh, okay. So, uh, Mauricio, uh, if if that. That, that is the name. Uh, I understand machine learning potentials are very hard to generalize, uh, i.e. there cannot be a machine learning equivalent to CHARM or OPLS, which works well for some families of materials. Uh, can you elaborate on this? So, uh, so the machine learning potential that I have trained also because uh, I, I, I'm, I'm on the lazy side or for a single system, but I have seen machine learning potentials for a class of uh, molecules. I think the ones come to my mind is the ANI. Uh, I think it's from uh, Alexandra, Alexandra, uh, what, what's his last name? I don't but remember. It's, it's the ANI CXX. So, that thing. I think they were trained on uh, QM9. Uh, they were trained on small molecular molecular data set. And as a result, it's applicable uh, to uh, a, a very large collection of small molecules as well. And I believe the Shinette uh, from Klaus Muller and uh, uh, Alex Tachenko and their co-workers, it should also be applicable. I think it was it can also be trained on uh, the, the collection of small molecules. Now back to ANI, uh, they also use uh, the baylor Palinello neural network architecture. So meaning that, so it's actually the same architecture as the ones that I have used before. So it's really by a choice that I didn't train uh, our neural network that is that can be generalized uh, to other systems so it is possible
Okay, so let's go to the uh, like uh, the last 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 uh, question uh, from uh, Leonardo. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, okay. Since you have many experimental phase diagrams, can you use that as an output for your training data set? Like, for example, you can take many studies and artificially create a data file with those data and use that as an output to train, for example, to use as a shortcut for your training data set and your results. You could, for example, take the structures from your database already and compare it to the results that are published and use that as a way to try and, how can I say that, smooth out the result from your predictions and the FT and such, or am I being... So which which uh, so what what type of uh, experimental uh, observation are, are you referring to? For example, uh, specific heat. You have, for example, you can pinpoint a phase transition from a peak on on that on your specific heat. For example, I work with Hubble models and stuff in search, and generally there is the peak on specific heat that indicates the phase transition. Could you use that, the experimental specific heat, as a way to create phase diagrams as a training data set? Mm. Well, for example, you have the experimental phase diagrams. You can uh, you look at that uh, different papers and try to create that, or am I right. made a mistake? Right. So I think this uh, this basically uh, brings. Uh, this is the issue that we have already. So my my uh, thinking on on that problem is like, let's say we have a machine learning potential energy surface, right? We also have the uh, that that we train from uh, DFT, and we also have the the experimental observation. And how do we build the framework that utilize both type of data, right? So uh, this hasn't been done. And uh, my, uh, my hunch is that one way of doing it is basically to have your experimental observable also into, your, into the loss function when we train, right? But then this is not obvious because when we train the machine learning potential against DFT, we are basically matching the energy and forces. But the experimental observable, particularly the heat capacity and all that, and heat diffusion that you have mentioned, they are very, they are, uh, they, they, they are not a simple function of the atomic configurations. They are not directly related to the atomic environment. They are rela related to the uh, atomic configurations in a very, very complex kind of way. So it's not completely obvious that how do we build this loss function that also incorporates experimental observable, although in principle, this can be done. Okay, thank you. That okay. answered my question. Thank you. Okay, so I will say this is, that's all for the day. Like, uh, do organizers have something else to say? No, uh, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I'll remember the next session it's earlier, right, Asia? It's yes, exactly. Next session is at 12.30 European time. So just check what is your in your time zone one and a half hour earlier. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we and can... Thanks very much for organizing. Thanks to you, Vinking. Thank, Thank you very much again. It was a really nice talk. Yeah. I think the participants enjoy it because we are getting really a lot of messages. Uh, so you can read it after. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye